Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by speculative fiction author, host of the Story King podcast, and homeschooling dad, Giancarlo Gadini. Giancarlo, his writings have been featured in anthologies as well as Writer's Digest. He's written four books, so we're going to be talking to him about his life, his books, how he got started, and homeschooling as well. Giancarlo, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, why don't you start off by giving everybody a little bit of background about yourself? Sure. As you said, I am an author of speculative fiction. I write novellas as well as short stories. I've had short stories featured in anthologies. I've also written an article that you can find on writersdigest.com. I'm also the host of the Story King podcast, which is a show featuring inspirational conversations with various creatives and entrepreneurs about the art and business of storytelling and living life. And I'm also a stay-at-home dad who homeschools three boys ages 7, 11, and 12. And so far, I have four books to my credit, three of them available on Amazon and another one exclusively on my website, storykingbooks.com. Well, tell us what a speculative fiction author is. Sure. So the term speculative just means anything that's fantasy or sci-fi-ish, right? So, so that it's kind of an umbrella term for it could be fairy tales, it could be sci-fi, it could be fantasy like Lord of the Rings, anything that's not really in the real world that you can pinpoint into the real world would be speculative fiction. So I like to think of my stories as sort of like fantasy parables. There's always some type of parabolic element to my stories. And that's basically how how to describe speculative fiction. So mostly I'm a short story writer. So I just released a, my first collection of short stories called Massimo's Mirror and Other Stories. But I have two books that I consider novellas. Novellas are just short novels, novelettes, some people call them. And that's one is called Darren Deleuze and the Devil, and the other is called Cain's Confession. And again, both of these have very speculative aspects to them. Well, let's talk about how you got into writing and also how you got into the specific genre of writing that you do. Yeah, that's a good question. So I've always been writing since I was a kid, but I didn't necessarily write stories until my 30s. I'm 45 now. So, I mean, I've written stories throughout the years, but nothing consistent. I was more of a songwriter. I was an independent music producer for 20 years. I've had, you know, so that's where most of my creativity had gone into for the last 20 something years before actually getting into writing. And I always thought of writing as something I would do when I got older. But, you know, after I was done with my career, and so forth. I always thought of myself as an older man writing, but I quickly learned that if you want to know how to do something, you first have to learn how to do it. And that writing can take years just to learn. So I I started writing in my early thirties and it took about 10 years before I was able to really consider myself a confident writer. As far as the speculative nature of my stories, I, I attribute that to my grandfather. He was a surrealist painter if you're familiar with Salvador Dali with the melting clocks and artists like that, that was sort of his genre of painting. So I had that heavy influence in my life as far as speculative things where that are very dreamy like, and I just took that over into writing. So just as my, my grandfather was a painter and that's where he did his speculative work. I kind of just brought it into storytelling. Well, let's switch over real quick and talk about Mm -hmm. homeschooling. You you homeschool your kids. What made you make the decision to homeschool and and what is that like? 
<laughs> what is homeschooling like? Well, I got three boys. They're ages 7, 11, and 12. And the 12-year-old will soon be 13. How I became a stay-at-home dad, because the, the homeschooling aspect sort of evolved from that. So when my first son was born, my wife was a tenured teacher, and she was making more money than myself at the time. And she had a better schedule than I could ever dream of having. You know, she's working eight to three, 180 days out of the year, summers off, weeks off for certain holidays. So it just made sense for me to stay home and take care of the kids. Plus, uh, we didn't see how it made sense to hire somebody else to do it because then so much of our paycheck would be going into daycare, you know, and we didn't have a family member that could really help us full time. As far as homeschooling, when our oldest, our oldest son's birthday is sort of late in the year. So he would have been left back if we would have kept him in the Long Island school district we were in at the time. And he was very bright. He could already read at that point and had some math skills. So leaving him behind a year didn't feel right to us. Plus, my wife was becoming increasingly alarmed at what was happening to boys in school. She's, she's a teacher. So she would see boys get labeled really easily. You know, if boys are fidgety in class or whatever. They started getting labeled with these issues and, and soon become medicated and so forth. And I know that's a very controversial topic, but she was becoming alarmed and, and she didn't want that to happen to our kids. You know, so when she, she floated the idea of homeschooling, I was like, well, as long as you're the one to do it, I'm fine. I was on board as long as I didn't have to do it. So I, I didn't like the idea of me having to be the one to stay home. You know, the idea of me even being a stay at home dad was that when the kids started school, I'd go back to work and life would resume as normal. But fast forward, we moved to New York City the Queens area. And we put our oldest into kindergarten and it was my wife's school. And with the new move and pushing our son into public school, even though he was academically ready, he might not have been emotionally ready because he was four at the time, but we just didn't want to leave him back because he was just advanced with, with the academics. So we didn't think that made sense to do that, but he had a hard time sitting still. He'd be checking the clock until 3 PM, start asking for my wife. Teachers would comment on how smart he was you know, reading and writing and, and all of that, but that he was real fidgety and he wouldn't sit still and he was getting notes home. And so we just had a hard time in the beginning and my wife decided to pull him out and, and wanted to try homeschooling. And that's where our homeschooling adventure began. And, you know, I was scared at first, just being a stay-at-home dad and not, you know, I wasn't sure what I was doing as far as homeschooling, but we actually found a community. There's lots of homeschoolers in New York City, believe it or not, lots of different communities. We got plugged into one and they they've been doing great ever since. And we've been homeschooling the other two as well. So even though my oldest did a he did two years of preschool, only a few weeks of kindergarten, the other two have been homeschooled all the way. And yeah, we found wonderful communities. They've been doing public presentations. They, they've done field trips to museums. And there was a place called the Center for Architecture Foundation one time in Greenwich Village where they would did certain classes every month, chess classes, sports. And we, and we found that we were able to really sort of curate our children's education. And that's what we love most about homeschooling, that it's sort of a curated education. If the kids are behind in a certain area, you can take the time and catch them up. If they're advanced in a certain area, you can sort of go, go to the next level where maybe in public school, we wouldn't have those, those options. So, so it's, it's been a great thing and, and I've learned to love it as well. So I'm totally on board now with it and we've been doing it for several years and we have, and we've plugged, we've been plugged into one community called classical conversations. It sort of takes a classical model to education. And so we have, we kind of mix curriculums there as far as having a little bit of a classical education where they study a little bit of all the subjects and including Latin and geography. And then we mix it with some more modern elements as well. So that's where we're at. So give people some advice and tips, those who might be listening that are interested in getting started in homeschool, how does it work? And, and what do you need to do to be able to do that? Mm -hmm. The best thing I could tell people is to uh, Google homeschooling communities in your area. 
because they're going to be your lifeblood. You know, a lot of people think like, oh, I, you know, homeschooling means my kids are just home with me all day. And that's not necessarily the case. That may be more true than if your kids were in public school, they'll certainly be at home with you more than not. But if you get plugged into a community, you'll find that there'll be days where several days will where they'll be with their peers and other kids, you know, the community we belong to now, I mean, there's, there's, there's like 40 kids there, you know, so it's not like they're just by themselves all the time. So that's one thing, you know, another thing, homeschooling definitely isn't for everybody. And it generally takes some type of sacrifice in terms of finances. It generally, it doesn't have to, but it generally takes one income, you know, because the other person has to be there to, to do the homeschooling. There are ways around that, you know, whether you have a night thing or a weekend job. So that's uh, going to be different for every family, but, but it is going to, you do have to navigate those different issues, those financial issues, because it is a different life. So it's not for everybody, but if you are curious about it, the best thing I could tell you to do is look up a homeschooling community in your area, reach out to them and try to get plugged in. And you'll find that there are several communities. So you may want to contact a few of them and then see which one feels right and, and get, and get plugged into one of them. Well, this next question is a two-part question. The first question is when you pull your kids out of the school district, is there something you have to sign or, or let them know? Because I know when you're in public school that you have to, you can't miss so many days. So what do you mm -hmm. need to do to do that? And the second part is, does homeschooling cost anything or what are the costs associated with homeschooling? Okay, that's a great question. Great two-part question. So the first thing is, you know, every district's going to be different. So some states are just going to be different. So I'm speaking about New York. So that's where I'm from. And yes, you have to let the district know that, you have to send a letter of intent saying that I intend to homeschool my child. This is for the state of New York. So every district, you have to look up what the requirement is for your district and your state where you live. But even within your state, every district might have its own different requirements. So you have to look up what those requirements are and they will be available, you know, online for you to look up, to look up. So as far as New York, New York City, letter of intent, you have to say, you intend to do this, you have to also send them four quarterly reports of how they're doing. You have to get your curriculum approved. And all this sounds more daunting than it actually is. That's one of the reasons why you want to get plugged into a community because they'll, they'll say, oh, use this uh, template and you just fill in the blanks with the templates. You know, when you get plugged into a homeschooling community, there'll be other people to help you with all that paperwork, you know, and, and, and how to navigate it, you know, we just moved to Tennessee and it, it's very different here. So over here they have, you can either tell the school district you're homeschooling or you could be part of like an umbrella school where different homeschooling communities actually become the school and that they report to the state for you. So every state's different. So you have to look up those requirements. As far as costs, you know, this is this is a, a tricky thing about homeschooling. So homeschooling itself, I, I would say, doesn't cost money, but certain communities that you belong to will have certain costs, like classical conversations that has, you know, certain costs that's going to be dependent on on where you are or whatever. But they have certain fees. They have tutors that teach the kids and certain supply fees and so forth. You know, and also anything you do is kind of, is going to be kind of out of pocket. You know, you're nobody, the state's not giving you any money, you know, to homeschool, that's for sure. So anything you want to go to, whether it's museums or whatever, you know, that that is going to be an out of pocket expense. So those are things that you have to think about and navigate. But again, homeschooling community, get plugged into one, they'll walk you through the necessary paperwork and, and also, it's just good to, to reach out to other homeschoolers that have been doing it for a while, and they'll tell you, you know, what kind of expenses there are that they incur and so forth. So does that answer your question? It definitely does answer my question. Now, I got a, another two-part question to throw at you. Mm -hmm. the first part is, j just in case people go back into some lockdowns again, mm -hmm. how, how did COVID-19 
affect homeschooling and the get togethers that you talk about? And the second part is, do you do like a graduation and get some kind of diploma or certificate just like you do in regular school once you're done? Right. That's a great question. So I would say the the lockdowns didn't affect the homeschooling communities as much and as profoundly as it did the public schoolers. I think it was more of a shock for the public schoolers who are used to, you know, congregating every day with with their peers. However, it did if did still affect us. Like last year, for instance, I didn't belong to our normal homeschooling group. I I skipped that year because they were just doing everything through Zoom, just like the public schools. And I just, I couldn't do it. You know, it was, I hate Zoom school. (laughs) You know, I hate having the kids in front of the, the screen for, you know, a few hours looking at you know, and doing school that way and, and listening to somebody speak for a couple hours. And to me, it's it's just too chaotic. And I, I didn't like it. So we skipped last year. So and if you didn't skip last year as a homeschooler, you, you may have found yourself having to do that, just having to do some sort of Zoom version of what you normally do. So so, yeah, I mean, the pandemic still and, and the lockdown still affected homeschoolers, but I would say not as profoundly just because Usually homeschoolers have a couple of days a week where they get together. It's not every day. So the shock of it is, I don't think, as bad as it was for, for, for public schoolers. And the second part of that question, remind me what that was. It was, you know, how, how in school you go by grades and once you're done, you get a diploma and all that oh, stuff. Right. How does that work with homeschooling? Yeah, I mean, that that's sort of something that's going to be independent and and unique with every with every group i would say that's a smart thing for parents to consider when their kids graduate to have some type of ceremony some type of diploma and so forth i would imagine you might get some type of certificate if you're homeschooling with within the public school system like i said like in tennessee you have the option of you know, registering with the public school district, and which, by the way, in Tennessee, if you do that, you're also allowed to play on the the sports teams, but the, the public school sports team. So even though you're homeschooling, if you're doing everything through the public school system, you can actually join, you know, the football team, the baseball team, all that stuff. So you can't if you're under one of the umbrella schools that that are just like a homeschooling community that's taking care of that stuff. So again, every state is a little different. And again, my kids are young, so I'm not there yet as far as the diploma, but I've heard of other homeschoolers who have, you know, created diplomas or whatever to give to their kids as far as certain states and districts, just sending them out when the kids are old enough and when they've proven that they've graduated, whether it's by testing or just uh, finishing out their uh, school career. I'm not sure if some school districts will automatically give out a diploma. That's something that I think every homeschooler should research dependent on the area they live. Well, I was thinking more of, you know, proof of for college. You got to, you know, have your diploma, your transcripts, all this good stuff to be able to get into college. So was just kind of curious of how a homeschooler can get proof so they can get into college and get scholarships and stuff. Yeah, well, they should still be taking their tests, you know. I mean, some people, there there are some areas where, and some groups where they don't like uh, going through the testing and so forth. But I like, I like, I like our kids doing the the state tests. I know in New York, they give you an option of like seven different state tests. You could take the CAT, you could take the New York test, the Stanford, all these different tests that you can take. And you're supposed to be taking them every other year. So you're still getting that proof of, of academic performance as, as you go along with the state testing. And of course, you're submitting quarterly reports showing how the kids are doing and, and so forth. So, so there will be that, that, that academic performance. And a lot of colleges, too, will have admittance tests, too, that, that kids can take. So there's a lot of colleges that are open, by the way, to, to homeschoolers. So don't think that just because you homeschool you won't be able to get into college. A lot of colleges welcome homeschoolers. That's really up to the institution. So you have to think about what college you want. And if you're in, you know, if you're in the beginning of high school and if 
child knows kind of the direction they want to go and you kind of know what school you want them to go, I would start looking into that now, you know, so that you, you know, what's going to be required of your child to get into that, to that school, you know, so if they have a more rigorous thing to get in to the college, then you want to think about that and, and not be too late with that. Yeah, every institution is going to be a little different. So you'll have to do some, each parent will have to do some research based on uh, the school they want to go to and also where they, uh, where they live and the, the rules for homeschooling. Well, let's get back into the books and the podcast. Tell us briefly about your four books and also tell us about the Story King podcast. Sure. So Darren Deluza and the Devil is my first novella. And basically this takes the, the classic archetype of a guy who makes a deal with the devil for fame and money. We're all familiar with that trope. And I sort of just took it to the next level where he realizes he got a bum deal and he has to go to hell to get his soul back from the devil. So that's sort of what that story is about. And I use humor in it. And again, it's a short little story. It's like a hundred pages or so. Cain's confession is about a young man named Cain, Cain Matthews, and he hits an old elderly woman with his car and kills her, but nobody is there to see the accident. So he book is told in journal entries, and it's really him wrestling with the guilt of what he did because he tries to just get away with it. And he soon realizes that his guilty conscience is not going to let him get away with it. And then Massimo's Mirror and Other Stories is my first collection of short stories. It's 50 short stories that I've written over the past few years. And again, they're all of a speculative nature, fantasy, sci-fi, things like that, all with a parabolic twist to them. And then lastly, I have an ebook called Launch Your Podcast Like a Pro, because as I was doing my podcast, a lot of my guests were expressing interest in starting their own podcast and didn't know how to start. So I sort of wrote that book for them, Launch Your Podcast Like a Pro. It's five bucks as an ebook download on storykingbooks.com, but it walks you through all the necessary steps to take the novice from podcast conception to a fully realized show and just how to go about that. I talk about equipment you need, skills you need, how to outsource those skills if you don't currently have them or have time to, to develop them. So that's what that book is all about. And then as far as my show, well, I started the show really to create a platform for myself as an author, but, and I was just reading short stories, sometimes my own, sometimes famous stories that are in the public domain. Uh, but I realized that was kind of tedious to edit, you know, like in a conversation, you can say a few times or whatever, and, and people expect that it's a normal flow of conversation. But when you're narrating, if you mess up, you should really go back and edit it. And I found that I was just spending a lot of time just editing that and it was becoming too tedious for me. Plus I found it kind of boring. So I wanted to try something else. So I started interviewing people. And at first it was just family members, friends, people that were in the arts that I knew in different artistic venues. And I would interview them just about storytelling, how they go about their art and craft. And then I, all these different uh, websites started popping up, these companies to connect podcasters with different guests. And I joined all of them. And pretty soon I was a year overbooked with guests. And that's where I'm at right now. And it's, it's been great because I've been meeting a lot of cool people, a lot of different entrepreneurs, a lot of different business people and artists, painters, writers, filmmakers, a lot of filmmakers. And yeah, we just discuss you know, the art and business of storytelling and also living life. And I get to hear a lot of cool stories. And that's basically what the show has been for the past year or so. Well, who's your biggest influence? Who inspires you to do what you do as, as far as writing? As far as writing, I have a few influences. So my favorite writers who I'd say inspire me the most, I would say is Ray Bradbury, author of Fahrenheit 451. Martian Chronicles, Something Wicked This Way Comes, C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, Kurt Vonnegut, 
and Italo Calvino. He's an Italian fabulous. He wrote several books and stories, one called Invisible Cities, another one called Marco Valdo, and his other one, Cosmic Comics. And he's just a great writer. And, he, and he, he's the one that whenever I'm writing a story, I, I kind of try to emulate the most, I guess. I just, he reminds me of my grandfather, like the stories he writes remind me of the paintings that my grandfather, who was also Italian, used to paint. So very surreal and dreamy with some humor to it. So those writers, I would say, inspire me the most in my work. Who inspires you as far as filmmakers and films? Mm. That's a tricky one. Let's see. Well, I love Spielberg. I love a bunch of Quentin Tarantino. I'd say those two would probably be the biggest ones. I'm trying to think of some others. I know I love really high concept sci-fi movies like The Matrix. I also like, like uh, that other one, Inception. I forgot the name of the director for that one. But I like those high concept sci-fi films, the ones that really just make you think and kind of go all over the place. Jordan Peele is a great director. This movie Get Out, I thought was brilliant. Just a brilliant horror movie to, to address racism in different facets. And, and I thought he just did an excellent job with that. So it's a lot of, a lot of good ones. Tell us about any current or upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about. Well, I'm working on a book right now about a guardian angel, but I don't expect it to be finished until next summer. So right now, my latest book, Massimo's Mirror and Other Stories, as well as Launch Your Podcast Like a Pro, I just released those this past summer. So those are my current projects that I'm promoting right now. And as far as the next one, the Guardian Angel book, everyone will have to stay tuned for because, like I said, it's going to take a little while for me to finish. But hopefully by next summer, I'll have a, a paperback ready for that. Throughout your contact information, I know you threw out your website, but throughout your website, your social media links so people can stay in touch with you. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Yeah, my website is storykingbooks.com. So that's basically where I, I kind of centralize all the information on Instagram. I'm story King dot podcast. That's my uh, handle. Facebook handle is story King podcast. And then if you want to support me directly, you can go to patreon.com forward slash the story King. And you can also receive some exclusive content by doing that as well. Last question. First part of the question is, tell us about some of your favorite guests that you had on the show and then close it out with some final thoughts. Right. So some of my favorite guests, I had one author named Haiga Boehm, and she was a very interesting guest. She's an author and she's German. And she, she told me the story about when she first came to the United States. I think it was the early 70s and she was eight years old. She actually came to Canada first before she moved to the United States, but she was so excited about coming to, you know, to the West. And she realized that there was a lot of bigotry towards Germans because of the Holocaust. And as soon as she got there, she was planning on saying like, hello, everybody. And she memorized this for weeks. She practiced this statement for weeks and Everybody started laughing at her. And then she said, like, when she was on the playground, everybody started calling her Nazi. And she actually dealt with this for several years. And it, it was this traumatizing experience because, you know, she didn't know much about, you know, the whole history of it. And she wasn't associated with it. She was just German. She lived in Germany. So she had no idea that other countries were just associating all of Germany with the Holocaust. And it was a really interesting perspective because she was talking about German guilt and, and the guilt a lot of Germans have just, just because of where they came from. And I never thought about that. You know, whenever you think about the Holocaust, you learn about the atrocities that happen and, and you learn about the Nazis, you learn about the Jews, but you don't really 
learn too much about the aftermath of all that and and the prejudice that that people had to deal with just because they were German. You know, that's something you really don't hear too much about. So to hear that she had to go through this as a little girl was kind of a a learning experience. So she was one of my favorite guests for sure. And, And she's written a book about two German boys that were in this Hitler's Nazi youth camp, so to speak, and how they become disillusioned with with their whole experience. So she was definitely one of my favorite guests and and her story sort of just stuck out to me, you know. And let's see who else. I've had another one. I've also had Malika Johnson who was who is film scout and she worked on a lot of big movies in New York and she talked about how just what goes what goes on in the filmmaking thing choosing a location and you know like some big superhero movies if they're going to have a scene in new york she's involved in a lot of that and where are they going to shoot it and so forth so it's just it's just cool to learn that there's all different kinds of jobs in the film industry that that people have that you don't even think about but these are the people making the movie happen and so it's a really neat neat perspective to hear that and what was your question after that you got any final, final thoughts. thoughts for the audience before we close it out? Final thoughts. Well, I would say as far as if you're an artist, if you're a writer, continue to write, continue to do your art, art because the world needs it, honestly. So make the time for it. Even if it's not making you a dime, make the time for your art because the world needs it. And you need it as well. You need it as that outlet, that creative outlet. So don't let anything stop you from creating your art and having that creative outlet. And as far as homeschooling, if you're interested in homeschooling, don't be afraid of it. There are lots of people that are close to you that can demystify it for you. Just reach out to them. Just Google a homeschooling group in your area reach out to them and they will help demystify the whole process of homeschooling. It's not as scary as you think, and it's actually very rewarding and enriching. Absolutely. Like Giancarlo said, the world needs your art. Another thing that the world needs is for you to follow, rate, review, and share this episode to as many people as possible so they can get this encouraging message. Also, Android listeners, go to the Google Play Store and download the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast app. The story king himself, Giancarlo Gendidi. Thank you so much for joining me, Giancarlo. Thank you for having me on the show. I had a blast. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream. Dream.